The mm-hmm. ultimate tragedy with this is, is that the only time it actually gets the attention it deserves is when a guy in Maine decides, mm-hmm. hey, look, man, I'm going to go in this bowling alley in this restaurant and use the skills that we trained him to do against us. And then it registers that, oh, man, there's a real issue here. Media and mental health. Let's talk about this. We have the honor today on episode 13 of The Silent Struggle to interview Mr. Willard Shepard. I am Robert Asensio. Next to me, or next to Willard Shepard, our guest is retired police chief David Magnuson. So, welcome. Gentlemen, thanks for having me. I think this is fantastic that we are talking about this and from both of you and your backgrounds that in our community, uh, this is something clearly that all of our first responders and our military people uh, is something that uh, we need to deal with. And I think we should be upfront about dealing with it. And fortunately, in uh, recent years, uh, it hasn't become a stigma amongst our community to uh, come forward and say that if we need help, Go get it. Yeah, yeah. Um, David, welcome back. Hey, good to yeah. see you both. Go back a long way with yes, my days very much PIO so. coming out with interviews. Always the consummate gentleman, I would add. Okay, but well, yes. thank you very much. Thank you. So it's kind of odd, right? Let, let's take a moment here to reflect on what we're doing. We are, as career law enforcement, we usually on the other side being interviewed by professionals like Willard. And here we are now trying to interview you. So bear with us. Give us some pointers on how to fantastic. improve the situation here. Doing great. Great. So, so still early. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> good point. <laughs> so, Willard, um, thank you for your service, first of all. Lieutenant Colonel, right? Yes, sir. Uh, U.S. Air Force, mm-hmm. you flew or still fly? I flew A-10s, and now I'm a member of the Air Force Civilian Wing, the Civil Air Patrol, and the missions of the Civil Air Patrol are search and rescue. Mm-hmm. Uh, if we have storms and... And the storms go by, uh, there's a photographer that is put in the back to take digital photos to provide for FEMA and our law enforcement agencies so they can actually see uh, what's there on the ground to make decisions about where they should deploy your officers or uh, medical personnel Mm -hmm. or uh, other supplies that FEMA uh, is doing. And uh, my favorite part of the mission is uh, the the kids. Uh, All of the kids in the Civil Air Patrol program get five rides, and we get a chance to take them flying, and we're going to get them out past uh, I-75 and over the Everglades uh, into the airspace out there. We're above 1,000 feet. Nice. They get a chance to uh, do their thing. But with the technology now, there's two glass. We had glass cockpits mm-hmm. in the CAP airplanes, and most of the kids are and most of, sometimes I have to cover them up and go, look, there's nothing on that TV screen that's going to hurt you. You need to look outside. <laughs> but that's the generation in which we, uh, we live in. Speaking of generations, right? So you um, are truly a public servant of South Florida, and I'm proud, and I can't say thank you enough because I've seen you on TV, but I followed your career. Um, now you're... After media, you went into your private practice. Let's talk a little bit about that and what you do. Yes, I've had, uh, you know, bar license here in the state of Florida, practice law for about 15 years. I always brag about my law school at FIU. We have the highest bar passage rate in the state of Florida. Uh, So we love the Canes and we love the Knowles and we love the Gators. And, uh, you know, therefore. Go FIU. Okay, there you go. But FIU for more than a decade has had the highest bar percentage Mm -hmm. passage rate of our students here in the state of Florida. And that's something we're very proud about. Uh, And all that time I was doing the news, you know, I was actually practicing public records law because I was gaining the material that nobody else had Mm -hmm. using our 119 statute, which uh, says basically here in the state of Florida, everything is public except... There you go. And the number one, uh, those of you in law enforcement, the exception that is used most of the time is 119.071, Section 2C. And that would be agency investigation. Mm -hmm. Uh, So uh, I've transitioned from that to uh, my partner, uh, Brett Rifkin, is a maritime expert. Uh, His dad was a chief judge here in Miami-Dade County for many years. And uh, I used to put Brett on television with uh, 
things that would happen above ships. So we specialize in aviation mm -hmm. and any transportation, automobiles, uh, anything that happens along those lines. Uh, people that uh, suffer an injury or the worst, uh, a terrible situation. I have a client whose son was a college student at Barry and uh, his Uber driver shot him and killed him. Wow. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, her hearts are always with yeah. her, but we're doing our best to uh, represent her and her family. So we're trying well, to help the public as much as we can in mm -hmm. that way. If the public wants to get a hold of you through your law firm, how do they do that? Willard Shepard Law and Media. Uh, they can reach out. WillardShepardLawAndMedia.com uh, would be uh, our website to go and uh, see us. And then uh, if you just Google me, you mm -hmm. know, we, mm -hmm. it's pretty easy to find and come up there. And we Very impressive. That. Very well, impressive. Role model of a century. Well, isn't that what I always thank the Wilson taxpayers. Yeah. I always thank the yeah. taxpayers giving me a million dollar education flying fighter planes and thank NBC because NBC paid for me to go to law school and pay for my bar license. So anybody out there, you get a chance to get some free education. Absolutely. Go get it. Yes, sir. Lord knows it's expensive. So, David, before we get into the, the silent struggle of mental health and, and an experience that Willard had that I really want to highlight here, any thoughts? Well, I know a little bit about the story you're going to tell, and, and, it, and it's phenomenal. Uh, so I'd like to get right to it. Okay. Uh, there's many stories, yeah. you know, and going back so many years, there's a, there's a ton of stories, I'm sure. Uh, but this one particularly stands out, so I'd love to hear it. Yeah, mm -hmm. so 2013, let's frame it up, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. 2013, uh, I think you're working on the job. Correct me if I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. you're, Correct. You're, you're reporting, right? You're out there reporting, responding to incidents. You come across a veteran who is in crisis, suicidal. Mm -hmm. Take it from there. Tell us what happens. Uh, well, first of all, let me just say this, that I have huge admiration and respect for our people in the Army, and the Marine Corps. My son's a Marine. I won't hold it against uh, him. Okay. That's what I say every day when I see him. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and, you know, the naval branches of our services, but uh, especially when it comes to the Army and the Marines. I always say, I never been to Iraq. I just been over it, which is a gigantic mm -hmm. difference. Mm -hmm. Uh, our military services and people who are actually on the ground, uh, there's a gigantic difference. Me dropping a Mark 82 500 pound bomb on a building and leaving at a high rate of speed versus those of you in your profession going through a door and there's somebody on the other side of it. There's a lot to, I'm a amateur boxer. There's a big difference, man, oh, between you looking at somebody in the face mm -hmm. and, that, and that. So I got gargantuan respect for uh, the branch of our military service that are actually, I'm going to use the word, engaged in close quarter combat. combat. Mm -hmm. uh, and the types of psychological issues that comes with, along with our law enforcement, which is the in exactly the same kind of thing, going to execute a warrant mm -hmm. to a door, and there's that kind of collision, uh, is dramatically different than what we uh, experience in the Air Force. And I want to be very clear uh, that, you know, that those experiences are completely different and the type of trauma that people suffer, whether it's on the law enforcement side or military side, in those close quarter type situations uh, is different. Therefore, on the veteran side, you see far more people who are Army veterans or on active duty or in the reserve, and the same uh, with uh, the Marine Corps that experience PTSD issues is much greater from a percentage point of view than it is those of us who are in the Air Force. Uh, I say all of that because Mr. Freddy Gutierrez was uh, an Army Vietnam uh, veteran. Uh, he was originally from Colombia. After he had served our country in combat in Vietnam mm -hmm. and come back here to the United States and lived here mm -hmm. for many years, and for some reason, the paperwork to actually get his citizenship was in a dormant status for many years. And then he was notified that he was going to have to leave the country, which obviously wasn't mm -hmm. the correct mm -hmm. thing to do. And that triggered his decision making process to go and obtain a long weapon rifle and go up on the Florida Turnpike over 595 at an overpass uh, in Broward County. 
and he shut the traffic down. He did everything. I wasn't actually on the scene reporting at that time. Um, I might have been coming out of the gym at my home or whatever, but the Broward Sheriff's Office and the Davie Police Department actually contacted me and said, hey, he's looking for you. And so we were able to uh, get Mr. Gutierrez on the phone. Uh, I don't practice immigration law. Mm -hmm. That's not my specialty. So I reached out to uh, one of my immigration uh, law buddies uh, who went with me, and we were able to engage uh, Mr. Gutierrez to get him to disengage his contact with the law enforcement and the public uh, on that afternoon. And therefore, I feel very fortunate that we were able to resolve this and follow this further forward through his legal process. And uh, Mr. Gutierrez and I remain friends. Uh, and, you know, he passed several years ago. Condolences. Very much so. He was a uh, person of the Panthers honored him at their game mm. uh, one night for what had transpired in his service to our country. And I say to all Vietnam veterans, hey, look, man, if I never eat another cookie or a baked uh, item, we got piles of them, man, that were sent to us in the desert. And our Vietnam veterans got nothing and didn't even get a thank you. So whenever I mm -hmm. find out somebody served in Vietnam, like the colonel that took me over the border the first time in Iraq or over Iraq, I got big hugs, big love, mm -hmm. whatever. And I'd encourage uh, all of your viewers and listeners, if they see a Vietnam veteran wherever they are out in their community, simply to give them their thanks and give them a big hug. Yeah, as we do all veterans. Um, but I want to put something in context here. Mm -hmm. You give a lot of credit to the ground troops, right? But you served. Did what? How many tours did you do over the Gulf War? Uh, I wasn't counting at the time, but the paperwork says that I flew fifty-two combat sorties. And you received like six medals for flying over combat zone, right? Correct. So we're speaking to a war veteran himself. It strikes me that you're very humble and, you know, and kind to put others before you, but you went through a lot of freaking stress. How do you keep it together? Um, my faith, God and the Lord, most important thing to me, and I feel fortunate, as I'm sure you all do, to uh, have the things that uh, some people, uh, you know, kind of take for granted. I don't ever take anything for granted on any day, mm -hmm. man. We got our spirit, our health, our minds, yeah. our senses, whatever to accomplish, whatever we're out to do, and we're very fortunate we've been able to obtain uh, an education and uh, employment that has been able to uh, serve and try to help other people. And when you do that and feel fortunate about that on a daily and consistent basis, you know, I feel very fortunate and very lucky, uh, 1000 percent. And when it comes to our veterans and our law enforcement people and their mental health, something that always puzzles me and I do not have the answer, maybe the two of you do is with our background and training, if with what you learn going through the police academy and our other academies, I am always mystified why our law enforcement community and our veteran community has the, a higher rate of homelessness and other things, because in a way we've received all the training in the world to cope with whatever transpires. And I don't have the answer to that. I don't know if you guys, you know, we, we touched upon this in previous episodes. Um, is it a perceived weakness to, to get help? And in the episodes, we talked about the broken arm. You know, if you see me with an arm, you know, out of, out of whack, I tell you, my arm's broken. Well, are you going to fix? No, no, it'll, it'll heal on its own. And you're going to look at me, you know, what is that about? Right. You know, get it fixed, put it in a cast with the mental illness, broken minds. Uh, we had on our first episode, Chief Manny Morales from the city of Miami. He mm -hmm. talked proactively about it. He goes for a checkup every, every month to make himself feel good. I mean, that's leadership from the top. Uh, so you have these situations right now where maybe that stigma, you know, fades away a little bit, that it's okay to get help, that it is not a weakness. Actually, it's a strength. And I'm, I think, at least in, in the episodes we've done, that a lot of these issues, as, you, as you're bringing up now, uh, I think people perceive it as a weakness to get the help or or that it's going to go away on its own like a cold. 
it doesn't really go away on its own and there's people there to help. And uh, if they knew where to find the help or if they're proactively looking for that help, that's certainly a step in the right direction, but your points are well taken. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, I, I, I can reflect on myself and some of the people that I ETS with or left the military with the time we, we ended our services. It was hard to transition back into um, regular life. Mm -hmm. And the challenges of work, you know, South Florida, as we spoke earlier, well, we, we, we were going to do another show and we, we, we were going over some stats. South Florida has quite a county area from Palm Beach all the way to Monroe County, south on the eastern side of the state. We have the highest percentage of food insecurity. And that per capita per, for the, compared to the rest of the nation, that is. So we look at the factors and, you know, jobs, housing are two major factors, but then you throw in the, the piece of mental health illness, un, untreated mental health care. I think that a lot of people that find themselves in those situations on the street often are just need a little extra help. They need a little more information as to where to get the help because I've spoken with a lot of veterans, people I've served with myself, um, who just don't know where to go mm -hmm. and they find themselves on the street. So, so that's the thing that we're trying to do here. We started this show just for your benefit of your, your, you, and we want to solicit your help because we started the show to discuss what others would not talk about the silent struggle. We know that people who are suffering from mental illness, or some type of mental condition, the majority of them if treated, they will, they'll have a greater success of recovery. But why is it that a lot of them, a lot of people are not going for those resources? And I think it's because they just don't know that they're available. Mm -hmm. We recently had one of our prior episodes, early episodes, we had Lucian Bertran, the director of the, what is the mental health, mental response team at 1-800-HELP-YOU. And anybody in crisis in Miami-Dade County can pick up the call, call 1-800-HELP-YOU, and they will be evaluated, and they will have a team come out totally confidential to them. No expense, I mean, free of charge. So it's informing the public more of what's available to them. But I wanted to get you, your thoughts when on you talk about what else can we the do? Public. And I don't want to offend anybody, but we're going to do a little bit of math here, okay? How many officers on your former department? With the reserves at the time, 20. When I was with the city, you're talking 1,200, 1,300. Okay, yeah. the city of Miami has 1,200 officers. Well, now more than, than when I was okay. on, but yeah. The city have 1,500. Okay. What's the population of the city of Miami? Mm -hmm. 700,000? Easy. Give or take, okay. yeah. Easy. Yeah, more. I say that as an analogy in a law enforcement you know, On the military side, uh, we have 1% of the population defending 325 million people. I said this the other day at a seminar over at FIU where we had the two State Department former spokespeople mm -hmm. in, from it, two different administrations. And with the city of Miami, just think about that. Way, way, way less than 1% of the population is actually protecting all of those people. So what does that mean? That means that the vast majority of people, they don't know anybody that's an actual police officer. They're not married to anybody that's a police officer. Their son, daughter, uncle, cousin is not a police officer. On the military side, they don't know anybody that's in actually, actually relative that's in the mm -hmm. Marines, in the, but they, they don't. Mm -hmm. So therefore, I think generally, when you mention the general public, and I, not all politicians, but a big chunk, while there's speech, oh, we got to support our officers. Oh, we got to support our, uh, we got to support our veterans. When it comes to actually, okay, you're going to do it mm -hmm. and pay for it. There's a gigantic disconnect because the 99% of the people, that's not an issue for them. Yeah. They don't, they get all the benefits of people who serve without having to make any of the sacrifice for it. 
And our society has dramatically changed since World War II, of when everybody knew somebody mm -hmm. that was in the specific theater or over in Europe. And that's why I think when it comes to the general public and therefore the real emphasis on the programs to aid our law enforcement and military uh, veterans and active duty and reserve uh, National Guard people who need assistance, that when a rubber meets the road, we're hydroplaning. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I'm su super supportive of our government entities and our political entities, but that's the simple reality because people don't have anybody that's actually in it, the vast, 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 vast majority of people. So disconnect. There's no advocation. Yeah. They're not advocating. Uh, the, the, the nation. Correct. Right? It's the something community. they may hear and or see, but it's not something they're living. Very interesting. Points well taken and made. Because I can remember when I started in the House, I mean, uh, 2018, I believe the budget, state budget, right, mm -hmm. was somewhere close to $100 billion. It was 90 some odd billion dollars. And the actual funding for mental health across the state was something like 40 million. It was abysmal. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that's what we want to do is convey to the public because there's, there's a nexus here. I mean, there truly is a nexus sure. between the veteran, what the veterans and the first responders are, are experiencing to what the public is. I mean, you know what? Right now, people are having a hard time making ends meet. Um, so, so, the idea and is the to ultimate end to that, the mm -hmm. ultimate tragedy with this is, is that the only time it actually gets the attention it deserves is when a guy in Maine decides, mm -hmm. hey, look, man, I'm going to go in this bowling alley in this restaurant and use the skills that we trained him to do against us. And then it registers that oh man, there's a real issue here and a real problem here, but now we've lost, you know, people, you know, that should be with their families during the holidays. Mm -hmm. And let's hope that when these types of things happen, that we can prevent them for the future and it causes people who may not think that they will ever be touched by it, that it can touch anyone. And I hope that's an impetus for all of us to be able to make sure that people receive the kinds of counseling they need. And as a community, we support, you know, anyone, no matter what the circumstances are, that has a, a mental health component where they need assistance. Thoughts? And Card in Lewiston yeah. sought out the assistance. That's one of the few that he sought out assistance. They could only hold them for so long, but he sought it out. Uh, so, you know, there's, there's, there's a quandary here. There's yeah. a big quandary dealing with military law enforcement. Uh, look, sticking with law enforcement, the, the more lo are lost to suicide than from gunshot wounds and or accidents. Mm -hmm. that's, on the that's, job, yeah. On the job. That's very telling. And for retirees, a lot of them, that's not all mental health, but a lot of them pass within five years of retirement. So there's something, there's that disconnect. There's that coming back to the real world that something's off. Yeah. Something's off. So, so... The idea is to grow this 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 podcast, mm -hmm. but also provide information and, and relevance, right? Because, man, I, I know that most people do not want to suffer. You know, were you were you working when when Parkland occurred? One thousand percent. I will say this: can't use any names mm -hmm. <laughs> because you know the great relationships that I have with our law enforcement community. Um, I was actually in the newsroom at NBC when this first transpired and I ended up on the phone with a person in our law enforcement community who I called because I knew that that person would have responded to this location and that person was standing in the hallway uh, when they were telling me what the numbers were that of people that person was physically seeing with their own eyes. And uh, 
I walked into um, one of our manager's offices before I walked out onto the air. And um, we made a decision that we were not going to reveal that information, even though I had that and what the numbers were. And we waited, uh, which I thought was the responsible thing to do. You know, so many times in the media business, you want to be first. And all my information is usually first or exclusive. Nobody else has. And in this particular case, we felt that the community should hear from the actual law enforcement official, uh, or if they determined political official, to inform the residents of Broward County and the families as to what had transpired. And it wasn't long, it was maybe a handful of minutes after that. Uh, at the time, Sheriff Jenny came out and then he revealed what the yeah. terrible tragedy had It was had Israel, unfolded. the Sheriff Israel. Sheriff Israel. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah no, no doubt. Uh, tragic, and that's very responsible reporting. Yeah. And, and no, Willard, you bring up so much content, right, and so much perspective that I know we're running out of time here on this particular episode, but I, what I'd like to do is, if, if it's okay with my partner here, we'd like to invite you back because we'd like to discuss. Sure. This, 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 this. There's a rhetoric out there, right? Mm -hmm. And in some cases, it is supported, and in other cases, it's actually false. But the the the, the narrative that non-responsible media, we'll call it that, non-responsible mm -hmm. media, is adding to mental health conditions and adding to the stressors of people's lives and inflaming this public difficult transition of time that they're going through, right? Mm -hmm. I think that needs to be, that should be discussed because a lot of people out there, including my family and people I come across, friends, they're always saying, oh, the media sucks. It's not that the media sucks. It's just you have to see who's responsible. Mm -hmm. And then you have the other sources of media. And we don't want you to bash anybody or any network, but we have the other ones that we know what they're doing. They're, they're discussing themes mm -hmm. that are Correct. for all the other audiences. And to be fair, it's more on a national level than local. I don't mm -hmm. hear anybody going around, regardless what channel is saying, the media, you know, sucks here. Sure. But it's a national level, and and, it, and basically it comes down, you know, the, the, the tribalism between the different networks. We don't have to get into that per se, but... Yeah, it adds to the stress. It adds to it adds to tension around a dinner table, uh, you know, by and large, uh, when it comes to what's being pushed out. We had a, a young lady who's a friend of ours make a generational comment more about me than you guys, because you guys are younger than me, um, and um, a short time ago. And I will just say that uh, I don't believe that uh, unless she's gone on YouTube to see Walter Cronkite and uh, Tom Brokaw and Peter Jennings, you know, and Max Robinson, that uh, she would know who those people are. Great news personnel for yes. those of you that don't know. Yes, okay, the anchor men. <laughs> journalists. Uh, yeah, journalists, yes. On better, better um, our major television networks here in the United States, mm -hmm. uh, that many of us and our families, we had information we basically were receiving all the same information because those organizations were true journalistic organizations. They were vetting all the material and that if it made it on their air, it had gone through a significant vetting process mm -hmm. as our local news operations do here now and our print operations. Well, that's been transitioned more into a business model mm -hmm. whereby to garner a certain segment of the market, you need to say certain things. And so there's less of the actual real journalism and more of what is opinion. And opinion's fantastic. I simply think that on all of these media outlets, they should have, like they used to in the old school newspaper, there's the front page that has the news, mm -hmm. and then there's a segment that says, this is an opinion. And when we have these television personalities on our news networks come on and they're giving their opinion, I just think that the FCC should require and they should do the right thing and go opinion. And when they're doing the news, then you actually are, can say, look, a person can look and see and say, oh, that's the news. It doesn't say opinion. And I generally think the vast majority of public, as long as it's coming out of the box, 
they're not doing that delineation or segregation between those two. And therefore, they're taking in what might be an opinion as fact. And that's gotten us in a lot of trouble. But the background of the journalist goes a long way because mm -hmm. in 68, Cronkite said, and it was an opinion, this war can't be won. Mm -hmm. Where Johnson said, I've lost Cronkite, I've lost the Midwest, mm -hmm. and a month or two later, he said on March uh, 68, he wasn't going to run. Yep. So if you have the background and that wisdom, perhaps maybe you can have an opinion. But when you're just spewing out stuff, sure. you know, right off you know, and, out of your and jacket. I'm sure that Mr. Cronkite's opinion was based on a significant amount of data and information from the was, Pentagon, and he had actually been on the ground mm -hmm. in that's right. there. I mean, that was a, a educated- Right after Tet, he went. Yeah, he statement went. Uh -huh. that he made. Mm -hmm. So for those of you that will ask, why are we bringing up this piece of the media? It's because it, it, there, is a, there is a tie. There is a causation of struggle, public struggle, and that's why we wanted to bring this up. Um, I think we're run out of time because I know that they have to start another show. Mm -hmm. But um, I really would like your sure. collaboration. Come back anytime, man, on this, anything with our veterans. Uh, any of our veterans need legal assistance out there for matter, please contact me. You know, whatever. Why don't you give I'm them here, another, another you know, plug as to where yeah, they can get a hold Shepherd of you. Law and Media. You just go on there, just Google me, and you'll see it come up there. And, uh, you know, you can contact me, and we'll help you in any way that we can. And I think it's fantastic that, you know, both of you are taking your background and experience and exposing our community to address this which is something that uh, is very, very important. And I hope that our uh, public entities, both on the fire rescue side and on the law enforcement side, and even on the federal side, that uh, you know we have some real first responders who are coming on talking to you guys and they're allowing that to happen and they can freely come and speak because those are the people we need to hear from. Yes, absolutely. Yep. Any closing thoughts? This has been, uh, it's been great. Speaking of amateur boxing, so you've, you've taken the walk. Hey, so man. have I. <laughs> That's stressful enough. I'm like, down there <laughs> doing the thing, man. Right, right, right. No, it's all good. It's been an honor. Doing the thing. Honor talking with you. I'll make you laugh and show you some, some well, photos. That, maybe, maybe we can do that in the next show. There you go. <laughs> so on that note, um, our producer, Alex Suckus. 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 Uh, thank you. Millers, the Miller Brothers, Miami's Community News team. We can't thank you enough. But more importantly, to our guest, my, my co-host, and you, the audience. Drop us a line. Let us know what you think. Thank you.